And now for video four. Before we actually get started with the material, I want to show you a demonstration of photosynthesis in action. This is a flower garden that I made for my mother. And this video, this first video, is about a week ago. Then I'm going to show you a video the next day. And then I'm going to show you a video one week later. Here is the first garden. I'm going to show you another garden as well. Alright, here is my flower garden. Notice there's poles there as part of an experiment. Usually I have deer coming and eating all my tulips. So I have these, these poles. I put a net all around it to keep the deer out. I've done that for several years. Now I just have poles up without any of the netting on. And none of them have come yet. What I want you to pay attention to is the size of the plants. Alright, that's what we're focusing on, the size of the plants. Got daffodils, crocuses, peonies coming up. A few other things popping up. There's some little pretty daffodils. Kinds. So I should be giving you a progress report on my flower garden. Now this is a lot of stubble and stuff like that. I don't really like to take away all the dead stuff of the fall because I like to keep all my carbons and my hydrogens and my nitrogens and my oxygens here. I don't want to take away all the nutrients. They'll all be gone. They'll decompose. There we go. There's my flower garden. I made the flower garden for my mom when my dad died. He really wanted a rose garden. There are actually a lot of roses here as well. And I added a bunch of other flowers. So here it is. Here's a second garden that is a little further away from the house. And here is my other garden. I shall give you a progress report as the semester goes on. This is the video the very next day. So notice how much the plants have grown in one day. A lot of photosynthesis to ha happen in here. Wow, this is just the next day. Look at all that. That is amazing. All in one day. Look at that difference. Wow. Amazing. And now, one week later. And now, about one week later. Notice the difference in the size of the plants. Here is a video of my garden about one week after my initial video. Well, the reddish ones are peonies coming up in the first video we really didn't even see them very well. Some of them were not even popping up yet. So this is a result of photosynthesis. It rained a few times providing the hydrogens and the electrons.
carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is reduced into glucose, into the sugars, the carbohydrates, cause it to grow so fast. Look at that. Photosynthesis at work. Here is the other garden. One week later for the first video. Wednesday, April 6th again. And this is my other garden. Photosynthesis in progress. So now we're going to do a little review of what happened inside the chloroplast and the production of the glucose. So we have already done the light reactions. I will review the cyclic and the non-cyclic and then we're going to go into the Calvin cycle in more detail. But let's look at this picture right here. Light and water. This is the photo part. Light reactions. Photosystems, electron transport chain, electron transport system. That's where the ATP synthase is. And this whole thing right here, this is the photo part. It produces ATP. That's for the electrons that came from the water. Hydrogens. That can be picked up by NADPH. And they can also be used in making ATP. Right, that is the power behind chemiosmosis. So that concentration gradient in the hydrogens is the power behind chemiosmosis. Oxygen goes out into the atmosphere. ATP and ADPH, when they're made, they leave the thylakoids, go out to the stroma, this fluid-filled area out here, and they are going to be used in the Calvin cycle to convert, to reduce, right here, carbon dioxide into glucose. So water gets oxidized into electrons, hydrogen, and oxygen. Make sure you know what happens to the electrons, make sure you know what happens to the hydrogens, and make sure you know what happens to the oxygen. And for right now, we're going to review the light reactions, and then we'll go on to the Kelvin cycle, light independent reactions. So first, the cyclic light reaction. Make sure you know why it's called cyclic. Make sure you know where everything is located, photosystem 1 in the thylakoid membrane. Make sure you know right there is the reaction center chlorophyll A P700. Make sure you know what it means, P700. Alright, so what does P700 mean? Anybody know why it's called P700? Anybody? Anybody? Pigment. And then it is going to optimally, optimally absorb light at 700 nanometers. So cyclic electron is going to go around and around and around. It may never ever leave. It goes around and around. It's a closed loop. The electron is used over and over and over again. So let's follow the electron. Here it is. At reaction center chlorophyll AP700. It has so much energy. It cannot stay where it is. It goes to outer electron shell. Gets picked up by an electron acceptor. It takes it to the electron transport system. All right, starts out with a lot of energy. So it has high energy. But as it passes down the electron transport system, it's going to release the energy. So it's going to go back to its initial energy level. And it has to get re-energized. 
So it returns to reaction center chlorophyll A P700 to get re-energized. And go back up to the electron acceptor, get taken to electron system, electron system right here. Remember that is where chemiosmosis takes place. Remember what the electrons are used for? Pumping hydrogen, the energy released of the electrons is used to pump hydrogen inside the thylakoid space. Alright, so we're going to be producing a concentration gradient of the hydrogens, and it is that concentration gradient of a lot of those hydrogens inside the thylakoid. Alright, just a few in the stroma. So that concentration gradient is going to actually be powering ATP synthase to actually make ATP. So one more time. Electrons. In reaction center chlorophyll AP700. And then photosystem 1 on the thylakoid membrane. All these different pigments, trapping energy, sending it over to that one location. It is the only place where the electrons can receive the energy. So much energy goes to a higher energy state. It's picked up by an electron acceptor. Full of that energy that came from the sun. It gets passed down the electron transport system. Releases energy to pump hydrogens inside the thylakoid space. Hydrogens build up, build up, build up in the inside. They're trying to get away from each other. They're all positives. Wants to go from high concentration to low concentration. So hydrogens are going to try to get away from each other by going through ATP synthase. So because they want to go from high to low, they're going to go through ATP synthase, so it's that concentration gradient that's powering chemiosmosis. ATP is made as those hydrogens go through ATP synthase. All right, this causes the motion, causes the motors inside to spin around, make a bond between ADP and P. Create ATP every time it spins around, makes three ATPs. Those ATPs leave the thylakoid, go to the stroma. So they are still inside the chloroplast, and they're going to be using, being used to reduce carbon dioxide into the glucose. But that electron that had a lot of energy from the sun has released its energy. It's going back to a low energy state. Goes back. Reaction center chlorophyll A it goes around and around and around. Look at my note up here. Make that a little bit bigger for you. Some photosynthetic bacteria only use the cyclic. And the cyclic can be used alone when carbon dioxide is greatly reduced and there's no glucose is being, made, uh, being produced. So if there's no glucose being produced, you don't need the non-cyclic because you don't need the NADPH. I'll explain that a little bit later when we get to the Calvin cycle. All right, let's go review the non-cyclic. Let's use a different picture than the one we used last time. So, let's start over here with water. Water. Is water going to get oxidized or is it going to get reduced? It's going to get oxidized. When it gets oxidized, what is it going to release? Electrons. Let's go. Photosystem 2, P680. Reaction center chlorophyll A, P680. Hydrogens. 
can be used in that proton pump, chemiosmosis. And they could also end up on NADP+. So make sure you know where everything goes. So let's follow the electron. The electron goes to P680. Reaction center chlorophyll A, P680. On all the different pigments are trapping energy, sending it to, in, focusing it right onto that electron. And the reason why that happens is because all the elect, all the energy is going to get totally focused. All right, none of it's going to dissipate. It's going to get totally focused on that electron. So that, that electron, which initially was in a lower energy state, now has received all this energy. So it's going to go to a higher energy state. Can't stay where it is. It goes out of electron shell. It's going to get picked up by an electron acceptor. And what is that electron acceptor going to do? It is going to take it down the electron transfer chain. Chemiosmosis is going to take place. So the electron goes down. And what is important of uh, the importance of the electron going down the electron transport chain? Why is that important? Right. It's important because as the electron goes down, it's going to pump hydrogens inside the thylakoid space. Right? And then the hydrogens, right, because of the concentration gradient, they're going to go down the concentration gradient, meaning going from high concentration to low concentration. They're going to go through ATP synthase. As they go through ATP synthase, they're going to make ATP. ATP now is going to go to the stroma, where it's going to be used to help reduce carbon dioxide into, into what? Right, glucose. So let's follow the electron. The electron came from water, went into photosystem 2, P680. Then it got picked up by an electron acceptor, passed down the electron transport system. See, here it is, the yellow dot. It's released the energy, so now over here, when it gets to P700, in photosystem 1, it is now at a lower energy state. So now it's going to get re-energized. Notice we have sunlight coming in again. So the electron is waiting there to receive all of that energy from the sun. All the different pigments trapping that energy, sending it to that electron. Initially, it was at a lower energy state. Now it's at a high energy state. It's at a level here. It's picked up by an electron acceptor. It's a different electron acceptor. NADP plus picks it up. NADP plus is going to get reduced. It's going to gain all of those three things, not just electrons, hydrogens, and energy. So that electron is being taken away. This is why this is non-cyclic. It's being taken away right, to the stroma. And what's going to happen in the stroma? Anybody know? In the stroma, you have the light independent reactions, Calvin cycle, Carbon dioxide, using ATP, using an ATPH, is going to get reduced into, into what? Glucose. All right, so let's go to the Kelvin cycle now. So again, remember all that is taking place in the chloroplast. That reaction in the thylakoid produces ATP and NADPH. Those go to the stroma. So the Kelvin cycle of the dark reaction takes place. It's going to be using that ATP, using that NADPH, 
to convert or reduce carbon dioxide gas into glucose. Clark reaction is really not a very good name for this because the dark reaction actually can take place and actually takes place at the same time as the light reactions. Better name is light independent reaction and it happens through the Kelvin cycle. The Kelvin cycle actually goes around twice. So first we're going to go through it as it goes around one time. And then we're going to go and show you another picture as a result of having got around twice. That will make more sense when I do it. All right, notice this cycle goes around and around and around and around. It is the reduction of carbon dioxides. Notice there's only three carbon dioxides. And let's look at inside here in the white box. There's actually three stages to the Kelvin cycle. Carbon dioxide fixation, carbon dioxide reduction, regeneration of something called RUBP. Carbon dioxide fixation, notice carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere, it's a gas, right? And we said that the carbon, remember from lab we talked about this, the carbon of carbon dioxide becomes the carbon of the glucose. So the carbon of a gas becomes the carbon of something that's not a gas, a solid. So when it goes from a gaseous form to a more solid form, that is carbon fixation. So let's look right here. Let's start this first part where carbon dioxide fixation. You need to know what that carbon is being joined to. So we're going to be focusing on the carbons, all right? Just the carbons. RUBP. It has five carbons. When they get together, the carbon gets fixed to the RUBP. It's going to make a molecule that has six carbons. You can cross that one off because almost as soon as, as soon as it's made, it becomes this one. Six, three PG. Notice it has three carbons. And this is where it's going to get reduced. It's going to be using six ATPs and it's going to be using six NADPHs. So let's look at the ATP. ATP, there's a P. All right, how many P's? Three phosphates, right? Go follow that around. Notice, now we have six AD. Two phosphates and six phosphates. So we know that there are high energy bonds, right? In the ATP, so one of those bonds were broken and energy was released. All right. And in another picture, I'll get into more detail. Now we're going to be using six NADPHs. Remember that was reduced. Follow it down. Notice it is now six NADP plus. So in the non-cyclic light reaction, it was reduced. And I received electrons, hydrogens, and energy. And then it goes and releases those same three things. Electrons, hydrogens, and energy. So NADPH just kind of acts like a taxi. Picks up electrons, hydrogens, and energy. Drops it off. Go picks up some more. Drops it off. And notice it's going to make six. So let's look at these numbers. Six. 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 Another one here. Six. Six. Six, six, six. All right, so this whole stuff of carbon dioxide reduction, we're going to have sixes. And it is going to make one molecule called G3P. Another name for that is, I made a text box, I thought it might be easier. PL. G3P 
and pgal are exactly the same thing. Just a different oops, Just a different name. So pgal, phosphoglyceraldehyde. And just another way to look at it when we look at the G3P. G3P glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And notice over here, it has three carbons. Let's see if I can draw it here. Right here. So carbon, another carbon, another carbon, three carbons, and a phosphate. And let me make these capital T's. So PL, notice it has three carbons. How many carbons does glucose have? Six. So it only has three. So let's over here. We have six. Six of these, right? But they only have three carbons. So look what's going to happen. One of those is going to leave the system. Notice five are going to continue on. Because we need to have, so we need to have six, right? So glucose has six. Two, three, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, we need six. But a PGAL only has one. So we're going to have to go to the Calvin cycle again. And we're going to have to make another one. So together, we're going to make a glucose. So two P gals, or two G3Ps, are going to make one glucose. So here, we only had a net gain of one. So the five other ones continue on. Now we're going to use some ATPs because I need some energy to make this reaction happen. So G3Ps are 5P gals having three carbons. Now the pictures are not showing us what happens, but notice we have five P gals or five G3Ps, each having three carbons. Go to the picture up here, RUBP, we have three RUBPs, and they each have five carbons. So something happened. So it's going to go around again. So let's go to another picture. Okay, so we have three steps. Carbon dioxide fixation. RUBP, which has five carbons, combines with the carbon dioxide. Again, we're really focusing on the carbons. All right, they're going to join together. So carbon of a gas becomes fixed to a molecule. That's not a gas. That first molecule that forms, I just cross that out because immediately it's going to become the next step. Carbon di dioxide reduction is the next step of the Kelvin cycle. And we know that actually has two parts to it. First part, it uses ATP. Second part, it uses six NADPHs. Again, the numbers are six, 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 six. So let's look at this one right here. So carbon dioxide reduction starts with six ATPs, ends up with six ADP. So let's look at this. So we have. Let me just look at the PGA. A. And then it's going to use six ATPs, right? That's not my gal. So 
let's look what happens. How can we tell that really happened? Look at this. Now we have... Six ADPs. Wait, now it had three phosphates. Now it has two. Look at this. PGA that now has a phosphate. So P gap. See that? Phosphate left the ATP, three phosphates. Went on to the PGA, now we have PGAP. So PGA with a phosphate. Everybody see that? And then our second part using the NADPHs drops off the electrons, hydrogens, and energy. Follow the arrow around. Six NADP pluses. So we know that NADPH, what was it? Was it reduced or oxidized? Oxidize, right? Now we have six P gales having three carbons. We start out with three carbons from carbon dioxide and we still have three carbons. One P gale is going to leave. So we have a net gain of one P gale. So we know glucose has six carbons, right? C6H12O6. So one P gale is going to leave the system. It's going to wait around until we go through one more time. So then we'll have enough carbons to make the glucose. So right here, five continue on. Again, we're not, they're not really showing us what exactly is happening in the picture, but you don't really need to know. So you need to know that you're making, regenerating the RU, RUBP again. Make sure you know why. We have to go around one more time because we need a total of six carbons to make the glucose. So we notice we have five PGALs each having three carbons. We need some energy to rearrange this molecule. Getting that energy from ATP. All the arrow now is ADP, and it has transformed that molecule into three IUBP, each having five carbons. So let's look a little bit more at IUBP. So look up here, here's the name of it, Rabulose biphosphate. So that is actually going to have how many carbons? Five. One, two, three, four, five. And it says biphosphate. It's going to have phosphates on either end. So that's RUEP having five carbons, biphosphates, two phosphates, remember phosphates are PO4 with a negative. So notice the name Rabulose biphosphate. And this enzyme is really important. Bisco. Rabisco is really the enzyme that is going to pretty much make this entire Kelvin cycle work. Because that's the one that's going to help fix these two together. So, Rabisco. Make sure you know what Rabisco does. So if you look at this text box that I drew on the side. So let's look at Rubisco. You should know about Rubisco. That is the first enzyme 
that is going to join inorganic carbon from the carbon dioxide to the RUBP. So it is super important. Did not have rubisco, none of this would work. So without rubisco, the entire Kelvin cycle would not function. So RUBP. Make sure you know about RUBP. Make sure you know that it has five carbons. And this is the substrate that Rubisco is going to add the carbon dioxide to. And remember another name for the Kelvin cycle, the light independent reaction, the dark reaction, is the C3 cycle. Can anybody imagine why this might be called the C3 cycle? Just looking at the amount of carbons here. So the first molecule we see have three carbons, notice that has three carbons, and the G3P or the PEL also has three carbons. So that net gain of a molecule PEL that has three carbons. Alright, let's go through this one more time. Remember we have to go through this twice. Twice, why do we need to go through twice? Because only three carbons go in the first time. So every time it goes around, you might see it every turn. Okay, there's three carbons, three carbon dioxides going in. Glucose has six. So one more time. Step number one, carbon dioxide fixation. Rubisco joins or fixes the carbon dioxide and the IUBP together. And that makes PGA. Six PGAs, each having three carbons. Carbon dioxide reduction now is going to take place. Remember, reduction is a gain of three things: electrons, hydrogens, and energy. So here, when ATP breaks the bond, it is going to be releasing energy. It's a high energy bond. It's going to release high energy. can tell, look, now there's a phosphate on PGA, it's PGA-P. So look on the side here, PGA, ATP, dropped up a phosphate, put it on the PGA, the phosphate. Alright, now there's PGA, that shouldn't be there. Alright, so now we have six P-gaps. Now, it's going to get further, it's going to get reduced using the electrons and the hydrogens that NADPH was carrying. So it drops it off, becomes six P gals. Remember P gal, G3P are exactly the same thing. Just different ways to say the same molecule. So then another P gal leaves. So now we have six carbons. So now we can make glucose. Alright, so let's look over here. So the actual the initial light energy from the sun right, was used to make the ATP. Alright. Then the NADPH was also made. And now we're converting the solar energy into chemical bond energy. This next picture is as if it has gone around twice. So these are as a result of going around twice. So start out with RUBP. Five carbons, two phosphates. So since this is a result of going around twice, we're going to have six molecules of carbon dioxide. So Rubisco, remember Rubisco. Carbon dioxide molecules are going to be fixed to the IUBP through Rubisco. And they're going to, after that one that I said you can cross out. So when they get together, it's going to form an unstable intermediate that immediately breaks apart into two PGAs. So again, this is a result of going around twice three carbons and a phosphate. 
In this case, it'll be 12 ATPs. Again, as a result, it's going around twice, so don't let that confuse you. So at one process of making a glucose is actually going to be using 12 ATPs. And it's going to be using 12 NADPHs. Do we understand? And it's going to make 12 P gals or 12 G3Ps. So again, the result will be going around, around twice. Two molecules of P gal or two G3Ps. And those are going to be used to make the glucose. We're not going to go into detail of how those become glucose. So you have to remake the RUBPs. Remember, they have three carbons and a phosphate. So all of these have three carbons right here and a phosphate here. So right here you can tell that 10 molecules of that is going to get rearranged using ATP six ATPs to make IUBP. So back to this picture. Inside the chloroplast, light reactions, in the phthalicoids, we made ATP and NADPH. Still inside the stroma, ATP and NADPH are used to convert carbon dioxide, reduce carbon dioxide into glucose. So it's going to use Kelvin cycle is going to use ATP, use NADPH to reduce carbon dioxide into glucose. Now that we make glucose, we can go on to respiration. So the glucose is going to leave the chloroplast and go out into the cytoplasm. The glycolysis is going to take place. So glycolysis is the first step of respiration. And the glucose is going to get split into two pyruvates. And those pyruvates are going to go now into the matrix of the mitochondria. So PGL can actually be used for several things. PGL phosphoglyceraldehyde is the product of the Calvin cycle. And it can be converted not just into glucose, it can be converted into fatty acids, it can also be converted into amino acids. And those glucoses can be converted into starch, any of those glucose polymers that we learned about in test one. So B. Two PGLs are needed to make one glucose. Glucose is the molecule that plants and animals use the most, so we're just going to be sticking with the glucose. So glucose is the number one molecule that is going to be used to actually make ATP. Now even though PGL is actually the product of the Calvin cycle, glucose is often considered to be the end product. So we finished photosynthesis with the C3 cycle. We have converted solar energy into chemical energy or chemical bond energy. And we've done that through oxidation and reduction. So water was oxidized, carbon dioxide was reduced. So in summary of photosynthesis, we have photo, which is uh, light, reactions, cyclic and non-cyclic, where solar energy is going to get trapped by the pigments. Water is going to get oxidized. All right, nothing's happening to carbon dioxide yet. All right? Synthesis part is a 
might maybe turn that on a Kelvin cycle. And let's add a little bit more here. What happens in the light reactions? So in the light reactions, what are we going to make? Well, first we're going to make ATP, right? Let's think of the non-cyclic. First we make ATP. And then we're also going to be and that's going to be through the hydrogens, right? So that's, let's say that's hydrogen gradient. This is my arrow here. That is due to the hydrogen gradient. Okay, yes, most is right. And and a D P H. Oops. And a D P H. So light reactions. Both light reactions, cyclic and non-cyclic, make ATP. And they do that through chemiosmosis using that hydrogen gradient. And the non cyclic is going to be making ATP and NADPH. So, how do we come up with all this? Well, through the energy of the sun energizing the electrons that came from the water when the water was oxidized. So solar energy going into the electron from the water. Hydrogen gradient, hydrogen from the water. So it's really, really important to water your plants. All right, now I'll put my arrow over here. My reaction is going to be using Get rid of the ATP gradient here now. The ATP. And it's going to be using NADPH. And it's going to go to the Kelvin cycle. And it's going to use ATPH, use NADPH, and it is going to be making glucose. Chemical bond energy. So solar energy. Chemical bond energy. Right? Somebody understand? Alright, now there are actually some problems, two problems with photosynthesis in certain plants. So let's look at those before we actually continue on with respiration. Alright, we're going to look at something called C4 plants. Right. And now in this case, we're going to be using the bundle sheet. This is why I pointed it out last time. See the bundle sheet? Right, the jacket of fibers around the veins. So in this case, carbon dioxide is not going to be directly used by the Calvin cycle. So it cannot just go directly into the Calvin cycle. It has an extra step. Carbon dioxide is not going to be immediately fixed to RUDP. Instead, you have a C4 pathway that it has to go through first. So it converts the. Normally, what we'd have is three carbons, right? Well, now it makes it into a molecule that has four carbons before it can actually go back into carbon dioxide. And now carbon dioxide can go into the Kelvin cycle. And this is called partitioning by space, or partitioning of space. Carbon dioxide is fixed in the mesophyll. The Kelvin cycle is in the bundle sheet. All right, so one more time. Partitioning of space. Carbon dioxide is fixed in the mesophyll. 
but the Calvin cycle actually is in the bundle sheet. So the key thing is fixing carbon dioxide. So to deal with some of the problems, which we'll talk about, there's going to be different types of photosynthesis. So again, it's going to be different depending on how they're going to fix that carbon dioxide. We are learning the C3 plants because most plants are C3 plants. For the carbon dioxide here, so you can go directly into the Calvin cycle. Directly right here. This is all right here in the Calvin cycle in the stroma right there. So carbon dioxide is taken up by the Calvin cycle directly. PGA with three carbons is the first molecule that sticks around. Mesophyll contains the chloroplasts, so that's where it's going to take place, in the mesophyll. So C4 plants. Problem number one. So they're going to be dealing with the problem of photorespiration. So this is going to be hot and tense sun. And that is going to reduce their photosynthetic efficiency because when it's really hot and dry, really intense sunlight, the guard cells are going to close the stomatas. Otherwise, all the water would evaporate. Once the stomata close, photosynthesis, here starts the problem here, photosynthesis rapidly uses the carbon dioxide. Okay, that starts the problem there. Zip the carbon dioxide that remains in the leaf and produces the oxygen which can accumulate inside the chloroplast. The carbon dioxide, a carbon fixation occurs. Okay, we still have that enzyme. And then the visco is still going to join IUDP and carbon dioxide. When the concentration, because listen to that, so here's the problem right here. When the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air, inside that leaf, falls too low. Look at this. So inside, here is that. Falls too low. Robisco is going to start grabbing oxygen instead of carbon dioxide. So photosynthesis is going to no longer have access to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it's going to use up the carbon dioxide that it has. And in photosynthesis it produces oxygen. That's going to accumulate in the chloroplast. Carbon dioxide carbon fixation, Robisco, whose job is to join IUDP and carbon dioxide. It's doing its job, but then there's not enough carbon dioxide, so then it's going to start to grab oxygen. So in this case, right, which is called photorespiration, all the glucose that they're trying to make it's going to be used up. So sugar is burned up instead of being created. Solution. So photosynthesis. C4 photosynthesis to efficiently fix carbon dioxide at low concentrations. And this is the partitioning of space. So right here, carbon dioxide goes to the mesophyll. All right. Then carbon dioxide goes into the Kelvin cycle, which is in the bundle sheet. So one more time, carbon dioxide goes into the mesophyll. And carbon dioxide fixation takes place here. And then that becomes carbon dioxide again. And go, now that carbon dioxide goes into the Kelvin cycle. And those four carbon compounds are transferred to the bundle sheet cells. Right? Normally they're going to be carbon dioxide is going to join to IUDP. And that takes place here. So 
then it goes to see for Malik, it goes into the bundle sheath. It's going to get transferred to the bundle sheath, and that's where the Calvin cycle takes place. Now, some examples. So both the bundle sheath and the mesophyll layers can have chloroplasts. Another problem can be dehydration. Especially if you're living in a hot desert. If the mouth isn't going to be closed to conserve water, they could get dehydrated. Because if they open up their stomatas, all the water would leave and they would get totally dehydrated. So solution to our second problem is CAM. CAM plants, succulent desert plants, those have a lot of moisture inside of them, like cactus. And they're going to have a C4 molecule as well. But this is going to be called partitioning of time rather than space. So they're going to use the same carbon form molecule, but only at night to take up carbon dioxide. So they're going to fix carbon dioxide at night in order to conserve water. Because they're only going to open their stomatas at night time, and at night time they're going to be able to receive carbon dioxide. So fixing carbon dioxide at night, and then the Calvin cycle during the day. So during the day, no carbon dioxide can enter. During the day, they're going to use the carbon dioxide that was stored during the night, go into the Calvin cycle, and then they're going to produce the pea gal. Two pea gals, they're going to make a sugar. It's not going to have a lot of fit, uh, photosynthesis because the limited amount of carbon dioxide that's going to be fixed. Make sure you know some examples. Lilies, orchids, cacti. Make sure you know examples of different kinds of plants. C3 plants, almost all plants are C3, which is why we focus on that. C4 plants corn, sugarcane, can plants, cactus, pineapple, orchids. And we went to these problems here, benefits. And we move down the So we're focusing right now on how it works. So carbon dioxide goes directly into the Kelvin cycle in the mesophyll. Mostly in the palisade, which has more than 80% of the chloroplast, some in the spongy layer. Partitioning by space. Carbon dioxide fixation is going to take place in the mesophyll. And then that C4 molecule, you go into the bundle sheath. And the Calvin cycle is going to take place in the bundle sheath. That is called partitioning by space. Can plants, desert plants, because it's going to be really, really, really hot at night time. I mean, during the day. Really, really hot during the day. They're going to close their stomatas during the day so there's no gas exchange taking place at all. So they open their stomatas at night time. So at night time, there can be gas exchange. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere can now enter into the leaf. So it's actually going to store that carbon as a molecule of carbon that has four carbons. And then during the day, the carbon dioxide can enter the Calvin cycle. So this is called partitioning by time. So next time, we're going to continue on. So we have finished this part all the way up to here. We made chemical bond energy, chemical energy, in the form of glucose. 
And now we're going to be converting that glucose, chemical energy, into phosphate bond energy. So solar energy through photosynthesis in the chloroplast. They are converting solar energy into chemical bond energy in the form of glucose. Glucose cannot be used directly for energy. So glucose now has to be converted into ATP. And that is what cellular respiration is all about. Converting the chemical energy, another term chemical bond energy, same thing, into phosphate bond energy in the form of ATP. It begins in, cytopl in the cytoplasm when the glucose leaves the chloroplast, goes to the cytoplasm, gets split in two, pervades, enter into the mitochondrion. All right, until next time. All right, have a great weekend. I hope something really, really nice happens to see you today. All right, till then. Till next time.